OK, so I want to talk about uh, the landscape function, which was the uh, initial title. And all that I'm talking about is uh, essentially joint work with those people, Doug Arnold, uh, David Jerison, Marcel Filosh, uh, Svitlana, May Borda, and yeah, probably others. OK, so landscape function. Uh, we work on a domain, uh, omega. And for us, omega will be a large box. Uh, square, it's easier. Uh, with this way, the simplest is not to think about boundary uh, values and take the thing to be periodic. Otherwise, uh, Dirichlet conditions are fine, and Neumann conditions would be fine too, but you would have to stay far away from the boundary. Let's not bother. Okay? And we have this main operator, and I can always write the main operator here. Okay, uh, which is the Schrodinger operator we lack all the time. Uh, v, you should think of V as being some, maybe some random potential. I'll give examples in pictures in a few seconds. Okay, and there are uh, two major objects in this lecture. The first one is the landscape function, and the landscape function satisfies uh, LU is equal to one and not V. Okay. And uh, there will be uh, uh, eigenfunctions for this. Uh, and then I put a lambda everywhere so that I uh, don't remember. Uh, this operator is positive, so I take my potential to be positive. This way, the operator is positive. If you are afraid, take even V to be strictly positive so that uh, there is a margin. And so the numbers here, lambda, will be positive too. Okay. And there is another object, which is the effective potential, which is just one over the landscape function. Okay. That's what I need to remember. Okay. A uh, long time ago, so this thing was uh, introduced by uh, Marcel Filosh and uh, Svitlana May Boroda a uh, long time ago. And they were actually, they noticed, I think, that some strange things happened. Uh, they also proved the basic estimate that you see here, which is that any eigenfunction is pointwise dominated by a multiple of this landscape function, lambda, by lambda, which is the eigenvalue. Uh, it's not hard. I think it's the maximum principle uh, when you write it uh, correctly. And it's some way of saying that the function psi is dominated by this landscape function, whatever the lambda is, in a way which is weaker and weaker when the lambda is getting higher. Of course, high uh, eigenfunctions are supposed to become more complicated. They oscillate more. So it's logical that they have less control. Uh, OK. So here is an example of a sort of uh, potentials that I'm interested in. So this is OK, one, di one dimensional uh, potential. Uh, probably in this case, it's just some uniform uh, potential on a grid. Some uh, uniform random potential was chosen on a grid, and it gives you this. And then you can compute uh, u. Uh, which gives you this. So it's sort of following the potential, but in a vague way, and it's a little bit more smooth. And that's what it looks like. And uh, here are the first eigen functions for this potential. And uh, this is supposed to show to you that they tend to be in places where the function u itself is large. All right, so for those uh, random potentials, uh, it happens that uh, very often they are localized, and they are localized in places that you can guess by looking at the function, the landscape function. Uh, this is the same uh, potential, uh, but in uh, 2D. Uh, there is a picture of the, uh, uh, sorry, maybe it's a, sorry, it's a Bernoulli potential, which means that the random points are either one or zero, depending on where you are. Uh, then the second picture is the landscape function again. And the third picture is a picture of the valleys for one over the landscape, so the valleys for the uh, effective potential. And the lines are crest lines. Okay, so in the middle of the crest lines, you can find valleys, and the valleys are the places where u is large and v is small. 
I forgot to say something. Uh, LU is equal to one. Uh, think about dimension one. In fact, you know, if you're not more gifted than me uh, with these operators, think that you're of dimension one. That Laplacian is second derivative with a minus sign. Okay, so here, this just corresponds to u second is equal to minus one or something like this plus v, okay? Uh, which means that the main property of this function is that it looks convex, uh, concave, sorry. Right? Boundary values and the function sort of looks like this. Right, it's positive in particular, and okay. Except that when V is becoming more complicated, here there is an effect on the equation, and uh, the function becomes more complicated. Oh, sorry, and I promised myself not to write down in this corner, and of course what happens is that I started with this corner. <laughs> All right, so that's the picture. Then the eigenfunction. So the first picture is the same one as the one you've seen. And the, uh, then the other pictures are uh, various eigenfunctions. So this is the first eigenfunction, then there is the second eigenfunction, the third one, or four and five, and then the one you barely see is number uh, 98, if I remember. Okay, and after 98, uh, it starts not being so clearly localized in the initial grid, right? And I don't want to say much more, but it's just a proof by picture uh, of what I announced that the eigenfunctions tend to localize in the valleys of a effective potential, all right? And it's one of those amusing things that I, I think we still don't understand why uh, it works so well on the pictures um, better than what we can prove. Okay, incidental, I think that's the, I announced you that some pictures would disappear. Okay, effective potential again, uh, one over u. And then uh, since you decided that uh, the functions, the eigenfunctions look a lot like the function u, uh, there is the usual trick that always works with differential uh, equations. You write down phi is equal to psi over u. You look at what equation it solves and it solves the red equation, which is number two, right? And let's look a little bit at this equation. So there is, uh, uh, it's still of a sort operator plus uh, something that looks like a potential is equal to lambda times of a function. So function phi is an eigenvalue of some potential, of some operator. The operator is the one which I write here. Uh, this is the effective potential. So instead of multiplying by the initial potential, you multiply by the effective potential. It's supposed to be good for you because the effective potential is a little bit smoother. And the price to pay is that the Laplacian was transformed into something which looks a little bit more ugly, where you've been modifying the coefficients uh, because you conjugate or something like this. So you multiply by, so it's a, an operator of div A grad type uh, where the uh, landscape function shows up. Okay. So for a moment, it's just a remark. If you want, if you're interested in the eigenvalues or eigenfunctions of the old operator, you can also look at the eigenvalues uh, and eigenfunctions of this new one. The eigenvalues are the same and the eigenfunctions uh, were just obtained by taking a ratio. All right. Then an energy computation, which I'm sorry, I'm giving you all those computations and then afterwards we'll discuss. The energy computation, so if you give yourself uh, an eigenfunction, our psi lambda, uh, so here, I'm sorry, uh, E is the same thing as lambda, okay? And the energy is the square. That's because, uh, that's because the physicists like to call E the energy level, which corresponds to lambda, and I'll still try to follow them. And I replaced lots of E's by lambda because I, have the impression it's better for us. But anyway, so you can do two computations of this thing. And so anyway, uh, psi lambda, you can normalize it so that it has norm one. And then uh, you can compute lambda or lambda squared. And you have two different computations. The initial one with the initial uh, operator is just the one you see in first, right? This one up there. So the one up there is uh, saying here you have 
kinetic energy, so integral of gradius squared. And the other one here is potential energy, where I wrote, wrote down integral of psi squared against v in a strange way, but it's just an integral of v against the uh, square of a function. Okay. Now, you can also take the other operator that I was talking about, and then the energy is written in almost the same way, except that now the Laplacian is replaced by this weird operator, so you have this conjugation with u in the energy form. And the second term is simpler because it's the integral of u squared against the effective potential, which is, uh, I claim, is a slightly better guy. And now what happens is that in many cases, uh, given psi, the way the energy is split into these two pieces can depend on the way you write this thing. And there are uh, many cases where the second way to write things is such that most of the uh, energy is in the potential and much less is in the energy, in the kinetic energy, which means that when you're looking at the second term, the term given by the potential, uh, it's going to be more significant in the second one than in the first one. And I'm sorry, I'm saying it's just, it just just happens in the examples. But at least for us, it means that we have to remember that the two formulas are possible. And maybe the second one is better in some respect. Okay, so far. So good. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, I know I will not finish my lecture. So, <laughs> you know, uh, even uh, throwing out some slides. All right, and again, I mean, we'll use this to say that some formulas become better. Okay. So now I wanted to call, uh, to talk a little bit about exponential decay. So the idea is that, okay, the idea is, uh, let's do a 1D picture. Uh, let's imagine that the potential is nice. Okay, or something like this. So here is a valley of potential. Okay, uh, you will cut everything at some level. Okay, and then you want to say that uh, on these regions, like on this bump, the eigenfunctions that you consider, that are eigenfunctions uh, with an eigenvalue, which is, let's say, below that, will tend to decrease fast when they try to follow the bumps. Okay, so in other words, in this region, you expect the eigenfunctions to decrease at some speed. When you're back to some region like this, you don't expect much, okay? And then again, here, the, fun the functions should decrease exponentially, okay? And there is a very good uh, way to measure all this, which is to use uh, what's called the Agman distance. So let me say a few things about the Agman distance. For the moment, we forget about the potential and we just write down the formula for the Agman distance. So first there is an Agman weight, which is uh, WE. So E is a level of eigenfunction, right? Uh, of eigenvalue, it's just a number. And then you take the effective potential, so one over U, uh, you subtract this level that you want to cut. So you would have what's left here, right? Uh, and here, okay. Uh, so you cut off, okay. Uh, then, in fact, you take the square root because uh, uh, homogeneity and the fact that you have a second order operator uh, are a hint that you should take a square root, okay? And you define a measure, a, a distance with this weight, which is the thing which is called rho e of uh, uh, yz. So it's a distance that depends on the level at which you decided to start, okay? And let's say the difference, the distance from one point here to one point here would be essentially the integral on this part of this weight with a square root, right? So these two points would have distance zero, but these guys would have some distance. All right. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the usual Agman distance. And if you want the uh, effective potential Agman distance, I don't see it here, but it probably it's going to be uh, exactly the same thing, but on the next, oh no, no, sorry, this is the, this is already the modified Agman distance. The usual Agman distance would be you don't write one over u, you just write the usual potential v. Okay. 
Now, uh, why is this distance a little bit better for some things than the usual Eggman distance with a potential? Is that there are, for instance, potentials for which, uh, you know, the Bernoulli potentials that I was talking about, it could very well be that there is a path in the domain where the potential is always zero and that can connect more or less any two points. In this case, the Eggman distance is zero and uh, we'll get no decay from the formulas and that's not good. The advantage of the effective potential is that it's more smooth, it tends to be strictly positive, and therefore when we say we get uh, exponential decay, we actually get it in more cases than with the other distance. Otherwise, the idea is still that you try to do exactly the same thing as in the usual case, uh, but you're lucky that you use a better form of the operator, if you prefer. All right. So this is a theorem that says probably this. So it's a little bit complicated. So let's say uh, you take an eigenfunction, as always, so a psi lambda. Uh, you're given some positive numbers. I'm not even sure, but I want to, uh, you know, you can read, but uh, it's not so important. So let's say here I cut at some level. And maybe you take a little bit of security, which means that, for instance, let's say omega lambda would be this domain. The place where the potential, the effective potential. So in this case, this, this is a picture of effective potential. Or in the other uh, class, it would be uh, usual uh, potential. Okay, you take a little bit of security, right? And you take a point here, and you try to see on this point what should be the size of the eigenvalue that you started with. And it should be governed by the size of the argument distance from this point to uh, this white zone here, or maybe the security zone there. Let me, let me try to see, okay? So omega lambda here is a security region a little bit smaller than the omega lambda. Omega lambda is a region where the effective potential is larger than lambda, okay? Uh, and then the main statement is the fact that this function psi, okay, in this domain is not only in L2, but it has one derivative in L2 with a size which is exponentially decreasing in terms of this security distance that you put, right? So that's, that corresponds to exponential decay. Again, not only the function, but also its first derivative are small when you get away from the double basin here, okay? And by the way, the, you need the double basin. If you were really interested in what happens far away from this basin, including that, uh, if you are unlucky, you are not going to be able to decide because maybe uh, there were two real, uh, I mean, two eigenvalues, one here and one there, but they just happen to be equal. And then uh, an eigenfunction would be a linear, any linear combination of the two, and you cannot get decay from here to here, right? They're just random coefficients. All right. So this is random decay. Uh, there are more complicated ways of stating random decays, like you look at for a domain and you try to look at the distance to some other domain and so on and so forth. But at least I think it's clear that this has to do with decay of eigenfunctions. And I won't give you any proof of this. The proof is similar to the standard proof with the usual potential. It's just that we use the different formula instead of, uh, of the initial one. Uh, it relies essentially on integration by parts. Since uh, you have been following things, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of these estimates. Anyway, you have to write down some estimates on L2 with some weight. You choose the weight cleverly enough, so the weight here, so that its gradient is going in the right direction and has size uh, more or less this potential W that I was talking about. You integrate by parts. And you get that the exponential, some, ex, some large exponential multiplied by the function is still in L2, and you do it. So I found out, I mean, it looks like a proof of Kalamant inequality, for instance, right? Which now you're all experts of. Okay. But if you ask me to do it, of course, I will not be able to do it. Okay. So I have just short comments. 
the comment saying that I'm not telling you uh, all the estimates. Uh, so let's say here uh, we decided Dirichlet or periodic. You can do this uh, a little bit more generally than that. You can do it for opera operators than other operators, sorry, than the Laplacian. Uh, you can separate eigenfunctions functions from different uh, domains. Uh, and there is, uh, maybe we'll skip this one too, there is even a variant of this thing here, which I still don't understand, by Tao, uh, Filosh, and Meiborda, which works on band-limited matrices. Okay. And band-limited, uh, uh, so if you discretize the Schrodinger operator, you can do it with band-limited matrices uh, of size uh, maybe two or something like this, two away from the boundary. And so what I'm talking about would be a very special case of that. Okay. I think I won't have time. Okay. Illustration of ex exponential decay. So I think you're here just for the pictures. So this is the same Bernoulli potential as I had before. We do it on purpose to choose it uh, so that any two points in the region, in the white region above are, essentially all of them are connected uh, uh, in the region where V is equal to zero. So the Agamemnon distance, the usual way would be zero. Not very useful. Uh, I don't write, but uh, uh, you saw already, I think it's the same example. Uh, you saw the landscape function, which was just looking like a strange thing. Uh, then uh, we have the same picture. The second picture is the same picture where uh, the, you can see the crest lines of the valleys, okay? And then this, this one here is the size of eigenfunction number one, uh, the base one, which looks like a bump, okay? And this is probably the most amusing picture if I explain what it is. So uh, I say uh, exponential decay occurs in the places where the potential, the eff effective potential is large, right? And uh, which means on the crests, okay? And here, this picture is supposed to, so you still see the same crests, and you're looking at the, I think it's the derivative of the log of the size of the function. And yeah, and uh, you see very well that uh, what happens is that this function uh, here is decaying faster at the places where there are the crests, right? Which is, okay. And again, this is more than when I announced in the theorem, but I'm saying it just happens that at least for on this one, uh, the places where the size of the uh, eigenfunction decreases fast are exactly the places where the function u is large. Uh, sorry, uh, u is small and the effective potential is large. Okay. Good. And anyway, it's nice pictures. Uh, so this is just another illustration. It's a periodic picture. So in fact, you just have one blob and you see it twice. Uh, I think it's a uniform potential, but it could be a Bernoulli potential, but it's something like this. You computed, so here you compute the size of the eigenfunction, number one, I think also. And here you compute the log of, uh, it says log of psi. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm surprised here because, let's say, one of them should be related, so I'll have to correct my uh, thing. One of them should be related to the eigenfunction and the other one should be related to the function u, right? And in particular, the derivative of the log of, of u. And they're supposed to be, oh no, sorry. One is the function and one is, uh, is the Agamemnon distance to the center of basin. Okay, and you're supposed to say it's the same. <laughs> okay, of course it's done on purpose. All right, so exponential decay for matrices, we'll see if we have time, which means uh, we won't have time. Uh, okay, exponential decay for matrices. There is one thing that I also decided that even in the other lecture, I will not mention very fast. Uh, there is a game you can try to play, uh, maybe here I can say a little bit more. There is a game that you can try to play is you have a landscape function 
and you try to decide where uh, where and essentially for instance what is the first eigenvalue for this thing so in principle I'm sh I should first show you the potential the thing which is gray here and you look at the potential and you say where is the I mean what's the level for instance of the first eigenvalue and you're supposed to say well it's complicated let me try to guess and then you have you make a uh, you, you make a choice and I'm saying this choice is uh, somewhat easier if instead I give you the landscape function or the effective potential which is written here and essentially it looks like the first eigenvalue is more or less the minimum of the potential and of course there is no theorem saying that it's the same but uh, there are uh, theorems that say that they are close to each other, uh, closer to each other of course, for a Bernoulli potential, right? I mean, the potential can go all the way to zero, but you know that the first eigenfunction will not see this tiny well. And the, okay. Right. Okay, so that's one of the things you can do. And the main, uh, yeah, the main subject of the lecture was supposed to be the integrated density of state, okay? And since we're among us, uh, I can tell you what I learned recently. Uh, that everyone else in the world is supposed to know. Uh, why would people care about the integrated density of state? So what is the integrated density of state? It's just a way of saying you count how many eigenvalues there are up to level E, okay? Or to level lambda, okay? And this is this number N of E, which is here, number of eigenvalues less than this, okay? Imagine that you've been picking a very large domain so that this number is large. And you want to evaluate this thing here. Uh, okay, uh, the next transparent will disappear very fast. Why would I care? So apparently, so uh, we've been meeting a certain number of people that do LEDs. So let me talk about LEDs. So LEDs means you know the lights, right? Uh, you have this material. You're able to do some computations on the materials, and in particular, you can get so precise that you can have an idea of, for instance, what is the Schrodinger uh, potential coming from just the description of a lead as, you know, uh, lots of uh, little particles and holes and so on and so forth. Okay, so you get two of these uh, guys and you want to compute from those guys the number of eigenvalues. And this gives an idea of how much light and at which frequencies you're going to be able to emit, right? So if you have lots of eigen if you have lots of eigenvalues, then it's supposed, I suppose, to be good for you because it means that you can emit, emit a lot of light. Uh, if they are all in some places, maybe you have an idea of, uh, you know, what sort of light you're going to emit and things like this, right? So apparently it's very important to be able to compute those guys. Okay. Right, uh, now let's try to play the game of computing how many eigenvalues. Uh, there is one thing which everyone is supposed to know is Vale's law, but it's an asymptotic, an asymptotic law. So it says that if you're looking at the very large eigenvalues and you compute the number of eigenvalues, you get that uh, at uh, level E, so E is very large, and you can compute it by looking at the volume of the pairs where C is in this domain that you started with, a large rectangle, and then, uh, uh, C uh, is supposed to be between E and, well, let's say C2 plus V is supposed to be less than E, right? So the two is again a story about a uh, second order operator, okay? But it's some, so let's say in this picture, you know, you would look at the length of uh, all those lines. You would uh, take the square root of those guys and integrate. Okay, and you would get an idea of what's the number of eigenfunctions, all right? And it's supposed to be very classical, but I still, uh, I still, we say a few things about how do you compute it, because it's the only element of proof that I will give anyway, uh, all right? Okay, so let's say you were back in the early '90s, and uh, we try to compute how many eigenvalues, there are how many independent eigenfunctions there can be of an energy which is less than some number, okay? 
try to do that. So the first thing is that, uh, okay, uh, why do I don't find my, okay, yeah, okay. Well, uh, I, I meant to be even more, a uh, little bit nicer than I was about to do. So if you think about large energy uh, eigenfunctions, in fact, when you look at them from far, they really look like oscillating sines and cosines. Okay, and the, uh, of course, the frequency of a sine and cosine relate to the level of energy, right? Okay, and I think that's, okay. Uh, then there is the square in the formula that I wrote down, and for the moment, let me just say that the square is natural. It relates to the fact that we're looking at a second order differential operator. If we were looking at the fourth order differential uh, operator, probably we would have a power four instead of uh, things like this. Okay, so there is a relation between scale and energy. It's not so hard, but I will probably not compute it. And uh, let me go to the next uh, slide, which is the thing I thought I was there. Okay, so I have these two formulas, and for the moment I'm talking about the vial formula. So I just look at the first one, which is energy, potential energy plus uh, kinetic energy, right? And this is the energy of a function. In particular, if a function has some energy lambda, lambda less than some number e, uh, it means that the integral of a gradient square is not too large compared to the L2 number of a function. Okay. Right. So here I normalize so that the L2 norm is one. And so what you see up there in red is uh, a really uh, quotient, right? Which means it's the amount of energy divided by the L2 norm. It's just that you don't see the L2 norm here. All right. Now, if you count the number of uh, eigenvalues or eigenfunctions below some energy, it means you try to estimate the dimension of the space of functions which have energy or really quotients less than some number. So a typical example of this, for instance, if you look at the first eigenvalue, the smallest one, it is the one that satisfies some equation and is the one for which the energy is lowest, provided that, for instance, it has compact support, right? Okay, and uh, generally, um, essentially saying, computing the number of eigenfunctions is exactly the same thing as computing uh, the dimension of spaces where some relic function is of some size. Okay, uh, there are two directions to, to go if you want the two estimates. Uh, in one direction, in fact, you want to find a large dimensional uh, vector space on which the Rayleigh quotient is not so small. And in order to show that the, large, uh, the set has large dimension, you just have to find lots of functions in it. And the easiest functions to find are actually bump functions. And why it's very easy to compute the number of, of uh, the dimension of a set of bump functions, because when two bump functions are a disjoint support, you know they are orthogonal, so they don't belong to the same thing. And you know you're making mistakes, but it's you know you lose a factor c or whatever, but it doesn't matter. In the other direction, you have to say how many, what is the dimension of a space where the energy is staying low. So for instance, for you it would mean uh, take the Fourier transform. Suppose the Fourier transform lives in a band what is the size of this uh, thing. And it's also things that we know how to do reasonably well, okay? Especially if you forget about the potential, which is what we're going to do first, okay? Last comment is uh, about the potential. Here, the veil formula is an, an asymptotic formula, which means when the eigenvalue is getting extremely large. And in this case, what happens is that the so the corresponding scale uh, is getting very, very small. And at that scale, you can consider that the potential is constant. Okay, so what happens in the Val asymptotic is that you're just having a constant uh, potential. And the last thing that I had in the, in the bottom of the slide is that uh, when, you're, when V is a constant, adding the potential V is exactly the same thing as shifting the spectrum. So for the computations, we might as well think that V is equal to zero, for instance. Okay, right. All those things. So at the end, I'm supposed to compute. And of course, at the end, I did so many remarks that I don't need to compute. But the, uh, 
uh, that's the game that we like to play. Okay, let's take uh, dimension one to explain what I mean. Uh, you are looking for bump function. Let's say you try to find uh, eigen, uh, the number of uh, eigenvalues. Uh, you try to find lots of bump functions. So let's try to find a bump function on a small segment zero uh, between zero and a. And I'm saying the uh, in this case you can do the computation. Of course, the lowest energy uh, bump function is a sine function, and uh, it leaves in this uh, interval size a. And if you can compute the homogeneity, it says that its second derivative is like one over a squared. Okay, and there's not much you can do more about that. This gives you the scaling, if you want. All right. Okay, now I claim that this thing here, and you can try to go both ways, but I'll try not to go both ways too much, and I'll try to cheat a little bit and not erase. Okay. Uh, I claim this is uh, a story about concavity, and I just do a bump function here. Okay, this is uh, A, this was zero. You forget about this, you're in dimension one. And what, I am, uh, what I'm saying in a complicated way on the slide is that if you're a bump function, let's say that uh, you could normalize, but let's say that the soup is about one. Okay, if you're living in, in this short uh, space, it means that probably here you have a place where the, second der uh, the first derivative is larger than one over A. Here you have a place where the first derivative is probably less than minus one over A, because otherwise you would not be able to reach that high and then go down again. Okay, and it means that on average, the second derivative should be fairly low. So a bump function is a concave function. Right, and then plus some things because maybe it can have a strange shape, but it has to contain some some concavity, concaveness. <laughs> right. So uh, okay, and I'm saying I do it in dimension one, but in, the, in higher dimensions, uh, it's just the Laplacian has to be reasonably small on average. Okay, and that's how that's essentially how you compute uh, the uh, veils. Uh, bound on, you know, you know, you you need the eigenvalue to be large enough so that you can be concave enough so that uh, the function can exist, right? But on a, such a small support. All right. So that's the that's the end of my proof of Bale's law, right? And uh, of course I'm cheating, but at the same time I, I I'm trying to to tell you what is supposed to work in this business, right? Uh, after the fact. Now, the fact is that now we are interested in uh, other cases for you're uh, uh, interested in eigenvalues that are smaller than very, very large. In this case, the potential is not a constant uh, in the support of my bump function. And I wrote uh, the equation again. So the operator now is minus phi second plus V times phi. Okay, and V is supposed to help and so on and so forth. But the point is that this term V times phi uh, is, the, is part of a thing that allows you to get some Laplacian, some negative Laplacian, if you want, or some concavity, if you prefer. But it's an average business, which means that you integrate V against phi. So if V is smooth, you can do the computation that I had before. And smooth should mean at the scale of a bump function, at scale A. Uh, if B, V is rough, you have a chance if you know that phi is smooth enough, so that in fact what really counts is uh, the average of V on the support of phi. Okay, but something like this has to be done, right? And it means that with the original formula from Bale, uh, it works, but only in some cases, okay? Uh, then I go faster. Uh, there was, uh, so there is some work of Pfefferman, and you can almost see Pfefferman coming in this game because you're going to look at bump functions on something that looks like, for instance, a box, a square. And depending on the size of a box, you will have different types of estimates showing up. One which relates uh, the size 
uh, of a box, and the other one which relates to the average of the uh, of a potential on the box. And the estimate of the Fabian estimates, so let's say uh, he has this estimate where you estimate the number of eigenfunctions n by an f of uh, lambda and nf of lambda, you look at a cube, you look at the first scale of a cube for which the, the diameter of a cube to some power is comparable to the infimum uh, of the potential on that cube. And you count the number of cubes like that, right? So there is a maximal function hidden there, which I decided not to write down, but the maximal in, in includes either the maximum of V or the average of V, and then something having to do with the diameter, you compute all the, the number of a bad, of a good boxes, and you get an idea of what is N. Okay. And it works fine in on the regular uh, domains V, but if V is really horrible, in particular, it's if at the size of a Q, it oscillates a lot, then the estimates don't work, some of the estimates, all right? Uh, but if the thing is, uh, yeah, the, the potential is nice enough, uh, then, uh, then there is a proof. And what we did, let me put a statement. Uh, so we have a variant like this with the effective potential, which has the advantage that it is uh, nicer, okay? And where you compute, uh, again, the number of boxes that satisfy something, okay? I had it, uh, so let me, I give you a statement, and then afterwards I give you back the definition of NU. So NU is a counting number uh, involving the function U, the landscape function, okay? And you have two estimates, one where you suppose that the weight of a function U is a doubling weight, which is weird, I mean, you, you might find out when you compute it, but it's slightly unpleasant that it's not given in terms of the initial potential, but in terms of a landscape function. But if it happens to be true, then there is a simple thing, which is that the number of eigenfunction is related in, a, in essentially the most simplest way possible to this counting function that we decided to define. And the main point of the story is supposed to be that this is an estimate that does not depend on anything. It's not asymptotic somewhere or somewhere else, it's just numbers. Okay, right. In the general case, there are two terms. So there is a fight between the good term here and the bad term here that comes from the fact that U is not so good. Uh, in particular, you want the difference between the two to be positive, right? And then I have an argumentation saying that there are lots of cases where we actually can prove that uh, C1 is winning against C3, okay? And my time is essentially up, but I still want to say what is the number. So you look at the number of dyadic boxes of size uh, lambda to the power minus one half, so the correct size for scaling, and for which the maximum of the ex uh, effective potential is less than lambda on that box. Okay, so it's not so complicated. All right, and I still give you pictures. So this is, yeah, let me just give you one picture, random uniform thing. We computed the three things. Uh, blue one is the truth. Red one is the way we approximate it, or we compute it. And green one is supposed to be the Bayer counting formula, whose main defect is that by definition, it always starts at zero. And we know that the first eigenvalue is not zero. So anyway, the curve has to be wrong already because of this. But, uh, you know, it can stay wrong. Let's say in the middle also, it's sort of wrong, whereas the other one is slightly better. Okay. And anyway, we have a theorem, but the theorem is far from being that precise. And I'm sorry for, so by now I know that my lecture is too long, <laughs> but thanks for your attention. Yeah.